Good evening. You can see on the screen, we're going to talk about the minor prophet Amos tonight. Amos being one of the minor prophets was actually the third minor prophet book in the Bible. He was a shepherd and sycamore tree farmer from Tekoa, which is in the tribe of Judah. And uh, he's not a uh, prophet by trade. Like I said, we were, he was a shepherd and sycamore farmer. But called, God called him to send a message to Israel. And that prophecy happened, or that he prophesied, in around 787 B.C., which was during the time of King Uzzah in uh, king of Judah and then the king Jeroboam in uh, the king of Israel at the time. Israel at this time has become very materialistic. They also turned to their own standards, their own ways, kind of left God. And Amos goes to deliver a message of uh, impending instruction or destruction uh, on Israel. But before he gets to Israel, he has some other ones that he goes through. And we'll see uh, that as we go throughout the story. So first off, he starts here in Damascus, goes and, and talks to them and their sins. Then he comes down here to Gaza and talks to them and their sins. And then Tyre. And then Edom. And then Ammon. And Moab. And Judah. He's basically starting to form this target centered around Israel. And Israel is that final stop and and final uh, instruction that he has. That basically takes place in uh, Amos 1 and 2, chapters 1 and 2. Chapters 3 through 6 are poems that Amos has written about their um, turning away from God and their uh, religious hypocrisy, how God hates their worship because they're not treating others the way they should be treating them. At Amos 3 and 3, it says, Can two walk together except they, agree, they be agreed? So they're saying that they're not on the same page with God. They're not walking the way God wanted them to walk. But in Amos 5 and 15, it gives them, gives, he tells them a remedy for that. It says, Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of, ho- of, the, of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. So he gives them a a cure, a, a correction for their, for their wrongdoings or their misplaced steps from God and not being on the same page as God. But God ultimately is, is selling, he's ultimately telling them God's going to send a day of the Lord, which is judgment on Israel if they don't change their ways and they'll be taken up by other nations. And then uh, Amos 7 through 9, Amos gets these visions, symbolic visions from God. One about locusts, one about fire, one about uh, plumb line, and really the day of the Lord is coming to judge Israel for turning away from God as ultimately is the message of these visions. <clears throat> but there are some lessons we can learn from the story. That's a quick summary of the story, but a quick summary. But there are some lessons we can learn. God can use you, God can use anybody for his purposes, for his glory, for his message. We need to align our values with his values, and destruction is coming for those who do not heed his warnings. <clears throat> Let God use you. Amos, like I said, was not a prophet by trade. He was a, a hard worker, a shepherd, a farmer, but God ultimately used him to, to deliver his message to Israel. Israel at that time, like I was saying, was materialistic. King uh, Jeroboam was very mighty and army and stuff like that. So from Amos's perspective, that would be something that would be somewhat scary to go up against, knowing that you have someone with such a strong army uh, that you're opposing. But God was on his side. He did not fear that, and he didn't let that stand in his way from spreading God's message or telling the message of the Lord to Israel. Growing up, I, uh, in school, did not, I missed opportunities to spread God's word because I was worried about maybe people, friends asking me questions that I didn't know about the Bible or about God. I uh, didn't spread the word like I should have growing up in school. And so I, I let doubt or fear, uh, doubt or fear, take away, you know, my 
ability, or I let that, I had that word earlier, I let that, um, keep me from, yes, thank you, keep me from really spreading God's word, I had another word, but that, that works too, but keep me from really spreading God's word and being the kind of servant of the Lord that I needed to be through high school and stuff like that, <clears throat> but I let that, that, that keep me from doing that, but Amos could have done the same thing. He's like, I'm, it could have been, I'm not a prophet. Who am I to go spread the word of God and tell uh, Israel that they're doing wrong? I'm just a shepherd and a, a sycamore farmer. I, I, don't, I don't do that. Instead, he set aside all of that and he did the work of the Lord and spread the message to Israel of their impending doom. <clears throat> but I'm glad Amos fulfilled his duty in... Uh, in the Bible, we see, we see him carry it out. I wish I was like Amos in that. But um, one of the messages we have, we have the same calling as, as Amos had to, to spread God's word. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Go ye therefore and, tre- and teach, the God- teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the, of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. So we have the same calling, the Great Commission here, to go preach the Word of God. And we can do what I did in high school and, and uh, let doubt and fear keep us from spreading the Word of God. Or we can be like Amos and accept that calling to go preach the Word to all those that we come in contact with to grow His kingdom and fulfill His, his duty. Also, Matthew 5 talks about being the light of the world. As Christians, we're the light of the world. Amos was the light for Judah, or not Judah, for Israel. He was from Judah, but he was light for Israel. But we should be the light into the world, being Christians and followers of Christ. It says in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may, that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. So we have a duty to shine our light, not put it under a bushel like I would, did in school, um, but to let our light shine and uh, let God be glorified through that as well. Another thing that we can learn from Amos is a lot, to align our values with God's values. At the time... Israel was off path. They did not align their values with God's values. They went with their own values. They went with the values of the culture. But they were led astray from God's, God's values. <clears throat> and Amos 15, or sorry, Amos 5, 14 and 15 gives a solution for that. If we are off course or our values are off course with God's standards, a uh, simple answer to that is seek God and not evil that ye may live. So the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as you have, as ye have spoken. <clears throat> Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the, in the gate that, I'm, that it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto you, the remnant of Joseph. <clears throat> so one of the things is we can seek, seek good and hate evil or, or seek good and not evil or hate evil and love good is one of the things that we can do to align our, our values with, with God. <clears throat> and what, how do we know what's good and evil? Hebrews 5 tells us about his word. It says, for, whoever, for everyone that uses milk, useth milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness and is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full, of full age. Even those who are reasoned by use, having their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So one of the things we can discern good and evil, what's good and what's evil, is by studying the word of God, knowing what he wants in our lives and what is that good and that evil that he wants us to do and what he wants us to stay away from. Going back to the book of Amos, Amos 7 talks about that vision of the plumb line and a a plumb line is something that would help keep a wall vertically straight, or a plumb line really makes sure things are vertically true. <clears throat> God uses illustration in, Jeth- in Amos 7. 
saying that Israel was not vertically true in their dealings or in their, their actions with God. God has that perfect standard. They were not vertically in line with that. But Amos 7, 7 through 9, it says, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made, of a plumb, made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of the people, people of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be a, as be laid waste. And I will raise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So he's setting a plumb line, saying. This is the standard. I will not accept anything more than this or less, anything less than this. But if they don't get back to this standard, he will set a sword against Jeremiah's house. So this plumb line is God's standard, and Israel had ventured away from that. They went to their own standard. They went to the culture standard. The culture always has this way of impeding on God's standard in, in lives of the world and lives of even Christ, Christians as well. The culture wants to persuade us that God is not the standard, but man is the standard. <clears throat> and that's the problem that Israel had. They followed their own standards, the standard of the culture, and their standard was not lining up with God's. They ultimately created their own standard, separate and apart from God's. But really every generation has in the Bible spoken about the corrupt and uh, crooked and perverse generations. Deuter oh, sorry, this is a plumb line. I actually should have flipped those around. But if you don't know what a plumb line is, this is what a plumb line is. If we go back to the plumb line. Um, that's actually an illustration of the plumb line. Uh, it keeps everything vertically straight. So if you're doing a wall, you're pushing everything or you're laying everything straight with that so it's straight as it goes up. If you don't use a plumb line, you eyeball it, you can get off a little bit. If you're off a little bit here, it could be off a lot more when you're up higher than that. But this keeps everything vertically straight. This is what um, God was alluding to in that illustration. So, <clears throat> every generation throughout time gets these standards or these um, perverse and, and crooked generation throughout the Bible. It says Deuteronomy 32, 3 through 5, says, I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto, the, unto God, unto our God. <clears throat> he is the rock, he is, the per, he is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. <clears throat> A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. They are corrupt themselves, their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and cro crooked generation. So here in Deuteronomy, they're talking about the crook crooked and perverse generation. Even back then, they had this problem. And like I said, in Amos, they had the same problem. And then also in the New Testament, Philippians 2, 16, or 14 through 15, 14 to 15, <clears throat> says, Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Here, he's not talking about the Christians being perverse or crooked. He's talking about the nation they live in as being perverse and, and crooked. But calls the Christians to be blameless, to be harmless in that perverse and crooked generation or nation. And to shine as lights. So throughout even our world, which is crooked and perverse, we need to be harmless, blameless. The same calling as to us today is to be pure, the sons of God, without rebuke. <clears throat> but like I said, the culture always has its way of getting in or, or trying to make its way into our lives. And Colossians 2 and 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through... <clears throat> Philosophies and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So, a heed we have in Colossians 
is to not give in to the culture and the culture standards, but to keep God as a standard in our lives. Another thing, way we can keep God as a standard by renewing our minds. In uh, Romans 12 and 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, <clears throat> that ye may prove which that, what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. I mixed those around. Um, but Romans talks about renewing our minds as one of those ways we can transform from the world and not let those culture uh, standards get into our lives. Another way we can do that is trust in the Lord and follow his, his will. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, or 5 and 6, says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. So put your faith and trust in God and not on your own or the world's standard. The... Uh, Uh, and then another thing we learn is destruction is coming for those who do not heed his warning. In Amos 4, God reminds them of all the famines and the plagues and the droughts that he sent to them to help remind them or to help try to get them back to his ways and, and their wrongdoing. But a lot of those plagues and things like that were plagues that they, he also did for Egypt. Hopefully, hoping to remind them that, hey, I lay you out of Egypt through these plagues. I'm trying to lead you back to me using the plagues on you now. So Amos 4 is a reminder of those things. <clears throat> but ultimately, they end up going into captivity in Assyria because of their falling away from God. But that same destruction can be upon us in our lives if we do not heed the Lord's call. Second Corinthians 5 and 10 says, For we all must, or for we must all appear before the, the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he to according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So we're gonna face a judgment day one time, just as Israel faced judgment here in Amos. <clears throat> and whether we're good or bad, we'll face that judgment in front of our, our Lord and Creator. John three thirty six says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So Israel had the wrath of God and the sword being on, upon Jeroboam and the nation of Israel. We have faced the wrath of God as well. If we do not heed his calling and turn to him. <clears throat> that destruction or that, yeah, that destruction that Israel faced was being led into captivity of Assyria. The, the impending doom or impending destruction we face is hell. And we see that in Matthew 15, 49 through 50. It says, so it shall, so it shall be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. And shall cast them into the, the, fire, the furnace of fire. And there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So this is the judgment, or this is the destruction we face if we do not heed the warning of our Lord. <clears throat> of hell, wailing and gnashing of teeth being thrown in the furnace of fire. You know, there's even some that will proclaim that they knew God that will face this judgment as well if they do not completely go all in in heeding the warning. Matthew seven twenty one through 23, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out many devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will <clears throat> profess unto them, I never even knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. <clears throat> we face that same judgment that Israel faced in Amos. That judgment will come upon us and destruction can be our ultimate 
gain from that if we do not heed his warning. <clears throat> from Amos, we can learn that, you know, God can use anyone. God used Amos, who was a shepherd and a, a farmer, to prophesy. We can also learn that we need to align our values with God's values. And that destruction comes for those that do not heed the warning of the Lord. <clears throat> Maybe tonight you haven't heeded the warning, but you want to heed the warning now. Maybe your values are not aligned with God's values when you align those with them. You know, Jesus died on the cross for your sins so you could be saved. Israel, their coming back would be to, to follow after God to follow the laws of Moses. But for us, we have greater hope. We have hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, like I said, died on the cross for our sins. You can accept him tonight by repenting of the things you've done to uh, make a commitment to God, to, to make a commitment to align your values with his values. You can make a commitment to serve him. You can confess that Jesus Christ is, is the Son of God and be baptized into, into the body tonight. If you would like to do that or if you like have a prayer that you want to come forth, forward with, you would sit on the front pew as we stand and sing. <clears throat>